and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center. A brief word about the Woodrow Wilson Center for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we were created by Congress uh, back in the 1960s as a living memorial to the only U U.S. president who was an academic, had a Ph.D., and was a scholar. And he, in his own person, brought together the worlds of scholarship and public policy, and that has been the motivating goal of the Wilson Center to bring together scholarship and public policy. And I think our topic today fits very nicely into that category. We have with us two of the leading experts on the Chinese economy. Uh, I won't go at length into Dr. Wan's background because you have it available in your program here, but he has, he's the principal economist with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, he has published extensively on the Chinese economy and has been following it for many years. And he um, doesn't just follow it, he analyzes it, I think, as you will see in his presentation. And I'm looking forward very much to his presentation because it will give me a lot of additional insights into what is going on in the Chinese economy at the moment. Um, Peter Baudelier is a colleague uh, from when I served in Beijing back in the early 1990s, you were the World Bank representative there at the time, if I recall. He's now an adjunct professor at the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins and has been following the Chinese economy for decades. So we are very fortunate to have two uh, leading experts on the Chinese economy to address the question of what are its current prospects and challenges. Thank you. Dr. Wan. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for being a little late. I, uh, it's me who got a little lost, I guess, uh, like probably some in the world now about the Chinese economy. They don't really know where the Chinese economy is heading, particularly if you look at the sort of medium and, 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 uh, and a bit of longer run. Um, of course, we, we know that at the moment the, the world economy is in a little trouble, and the Chinese economy has been sort of going down, and there are a lot of speculations. Um, so when I was, you know, had this opportunity to to, to sort of uh, have a talk here, I I actually insist on really looking at the medium run rather than in the short run because the short run a lot of uncertainties, but we've got to look into you know, the uh, more fundamental and and I believe it's the fundamental which is important in uh, determining the future of the global economy and, and other associate issues or implications of uh, the growth of the Chinese economy. So. Uh, of course, it's, uh, the, the, there are a lot of things can be said about the Chinese economy, a lot of uh, issues more than the economic side, but what I do today is actually quickly go through some of the, 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 the facts, uh, which um, uh, in the end I hope will give you a sort of some kind of, uh, kind of view, view on, on the medium uh, term prospect of the Chinese economy. Then we can discuss various issues. And I will, in the end, uh, pro mention some of the challenges which I believe uh, are familiar, very familiar to, to all of you, but, but there, are, there may be some insights which are not really you know, in, the, in the public domain which we can discuss. So uh, if uh, you let me, I, basically I, I want to convey a message. I mean, it's, it's my, more or less it's, it's been my own personal view for quite a long time, um, <coughs> irrespective of what's happening uh, in the academic community and, and non-academic community about the Chinese, the, the growth prospect of the Chinese economy for a long, long time. I mean, we, we know uh, <coughs> uh, doubts about the Chinese economy is, is not the current uh, 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 sort of assessment. It's, it's been going on for as long as the Chinese economy start to grow. Back in the you know, late 70s and early 80s, people always had different views. And, but I've been always having a more optimistic view. But that doesn't mean it's, it's you know, I'm always right and, 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 and you know, there are no problems. But, but uh, you know, if you look at you know, the fundamentals, I believe we do have reasons to be optimistic. Uh, so here, I, my, the message is very, very simple. Um, uh, I, I believe, in my view, China can continue to grow in the short and, and the medium run. And there are some reasons. That, that these are the reasons I go through. I mean, the message is very simple. Anybody can come up with a message. Uh, so does, the, you know, so do the uh, pessimist uh, economists as well. But, but we've got to, you know, try to argue, give, give the reasons why I, I do have this view. But then I, I got to 
you know, come to these major challenges, and some of them are, are pretty serious, and, and there are certainly uncertainties as to whether you know, the, the Chinese government, particularly the new leadership, can tackle those challenges in, in the right way and, and how long it takes. I mean, to me, some of the challenges, of course, these challenges are known and, and they, uh, to, to us and to the Chinese leadership, <laughs> and actually for quite a long, long time, some of them. Uh, the, the trouble is uh, you know, people expect, expect the, the, uh, those problems to be solved or to be tackled to some extent, but but some of them obviously did not really get to the attention of, 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 the, uh, of the government, and some were not really resolved satisfactorily. So uh, that's where the uncertainties are. Right? So let me just go through the, the, the fundamentals. Uh, I said there are few trends, few basic facts we've we got to look at before we can really sort of do a proper assessment. The first, very first thing is, of course, the growth uh, trend. Um, I mean, we know the Chinese economy has been growing, f you know, at a almost 10 percent, about 9 percent in the last 30 years on average, which is of course dramatic. But, but of course it has up and downs. It's not always growing very fast. I mean, as this diagram shows, um, it, it can go down to about 5 percent and, and you know, even below 4 percent sometimes, but it bumps. Yeah. Uh, but the overall, the, this red line is the fitted, very simple fitted trend line. And, and you can see it's actually uh, accelerating until even now, if you look at the, the trend, and of course, it's coming down since the crisis 2007, and, and you know it's dropping. Uh, but uh, but if you take the past, you know, a uh, few sort of up and downs a as an example, uh, you would see simply from this trend, you will see there's a possibility of this Chinese going to come back. <coughs> now, whether it's come back to you know 14 percent, 13 percent, personally, I don't. I believe you know we have some um, uh, uh, confidence in saying no, it's not going to be that. But but it, whether it's it's going to be the, the beginning of a really low growth period. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't think so. Um, um, so uh, uh, this, this is underlined. Well, what underlies this trend? I mean, that's a very important thing. So uh, I, the first thing we look for as economists, the, the, the most fundamental really driving force of growth, apart from many other issues, policies, international uh, uh, environment and uh, so on and so on. The, the most fundamental thing for economics is really productivity. Whether you know the, the growth now, Chinese economy is being driven by a lot of investments, a lot of inputs, but but productivity is also a factor, and and we need to really go go down to the productivity. And here's this curve uh, produced by the uh, uh, not by ADB, not by myself, but uh, uh, by the Asian Productivity Organization. Uh, and uh, you can see this blue line, that's the labor productivity of, of, of China. Um, it's basically, uh, it actually from the late 70s, it, it grown 10 times in the last 30 years. But if you, for, or the productivity of course in, in Europe and the US also been growing, but it's only doubled uh, over the same period. So productivity growth has been pretty strong. And, and we can see the trend is continue. Uh, uh, and then that will continue uh, in, in the future, I believe. And there are sort of factors, there are reasons why that's happening. You will see that just in a little while. And then I want to highlight uh, there are three productivity gaps. If productivity is the fun most fundamental factors apart from other factors, then we've got to look at the productivity issue more carefully. And here I want to, again, the, the, you can talk about this f you know, for hours, but I want to highlight three gaps where the potentials are for the Chinese economy. The first one, of course, is China as a whole. Uh, there's a gap between China and the frontier, of course, which is the United States. We'll say that in a second. The second gap is within China. When you, you know, uh, look within China, there are two other gaps. One is, of course, the, the gap across space, which is known to us. It's inland versus coastal China. We also will say that how big the gap is. And then there's another gap, which is, you know, China, is, we're saying China is the world of two countries. One is a rural country rural country and, and one is an urban country. And there's a huge gap between these two, uh, two segments of China as well, even in terms of productivity. And that's where the, the potentials are. So let's have a look. This is the labor productivity of China versus the, the United States and Europe. You can see that despite the growth in the labor productivity, we, we saw that a bit earlier, you know, was growing very fast. But if you look at the level, the difference in the level between the current productivity, labor productivity, and the U.S. and Europe, it's a huge, huge difference. At the moment, China produces about uh, 
about ten thousand per, per labor, not per capita, about ten thousand U.S. dollars um, in two thousand five uh, prices. So it's not the actually the current one, but but the the you know U.S. actually produce over eighty thousand per labor force, and that's a huge difference there. You know, you, we're talking about uh, you know about thirteen percent, um, and there's a potential. It's only a potential. I'm not you know saying it's China definitely catch up, but there is certain potential there. Then that. The second is within China, as I mentioned, here is the labor productivity between urban and rural China. See, as you can see that, although China produces um, you know, about 13% of the US economy, but, but within China, there's huge difference. The, the urban sector, this is in Chinese currency now, so it's not really totally uh, <coughs> comparable with the earlier diagram, but, but the urban economy produces about over 70,000 uh, Chinese yuan, the renminbi per labor, but but the rural economy only produced just over about fifteen, uh, uh, about fifteen thousand um, on that. So w we really talk about you know about twenty percent, thirty twenty percent in terms of labor productivity, and that potential is there as well. Um, now, actually, uh, for those who you know who really keep eyes on the Chinese economy, I mean we all know the the growth of the Chinese economy is is largely driven by structural change, and as have with other economies, but also it's it's driven by urbanization. And urbanization will continue, and that's where they move resources, they move labor from the rural sector to the urban sector. That's where the, the you know they will have catch-ups between the urban and the rural, you know, narrowing down of that gap, and that uh, will provide the stimulus to the Chinese economy uh, in the medium and long run. And then, of course, we also know the the regional or you call it, you know across the region productivity difference. Here we we. Uh, uh, e e e People often will have inland, coastal China, or you have so three broad areas, sort of coastal, central, and, and western China. But now the Chinese government, for whatever reason, they, they actually uh, divide China into four different regions, oh, very, very recently. And here are the diagrams. I mean, we don't have to come to you know, why they, they're doing that. But, but you can actually see virtually the, the western central part is far below, is, you know, in terms of labor productivity, below the coastal and even the northwestern area. That's the traditional uh, industrial area of China, and and you know, as you can see, it's it's virtually the the inland and the western China is about half of the coastal and northwestern region in terms of labor productivity. So now it's a bit the, the gap is a bit you know s smaller than the urban rural or the you know the China as a whole and and the global frontier, but but it's also fairly substantial, a and and these are providing the the potential for this Chinese economy to grow. And of course, we have got to ask whether you know, that will become reality, um, you know, whether these gaps can be narrowed down. And that's the question hanging on in our mind. So we, we come back to this, uh, <coughs> you know, the, the economics of this catching up. Um, you know, all these gaps provide the potential to catch up and, and where they, you, know, you look, at the, look at the more fundamental uh, forces. And here I, I just want to give you sort of very sort of uh, a, a bigger picture, basically, from the economic point of view, you, you look at the inputs. Then you, lo you look at institutional factors because you've got to put inputs into production, and that's where the law, the institution, and so on and so on, the, the system yeah, uh, for the. But labor people do have uh, done a lot of work on this labor front, but I believe in the medium run, we still have a, a lot of labor supply in China despite some you know temporary problems and a shortage of labor supply in the coastal area and so on. There, there are reasons for that, um, but but overall for China, uh, labor uh, supply uh, we have plenty of labor supply for quite some time. We'll see that in, in a second. Uh, in a second, and then of course from apart from labor, we've got to look at physical capital. And and you you would all know uh, some economists actually believe the Chinese economy to a large extent owes to foreign direct investment, which is a capital really inflow. But, but uh, you know, I always had my own views. I mean, foreign direct investment has been very, very important to China and, and to some other emerging economies. But, but I believe in the end, it's really domestic factors which prevails to, to drive the, uh, the economy. And we'll have a look at the, you know, China still has, they, they do have plenty of capital. And, but more than that, um, China actually has been trying uh, pretty hard to try to move, you know, the, the they call upgrade the technology later, try to move up. And that's where the innovations will become more and more important uh, in the future. We'll have some uh, data on that. Then, of course, it's the domestic environment. The, you know, people uh, have 
can talk a lot about you know whether this environment in China is conducive conducive to growth and not, and, and that's where the, the uncertainties are. In the last thirty years, people you know have doubts. They they're not really doubting the labor supply, um, but but the you know the the advantage of the Chinese economy. But but they really look at the non economic factors. Uh, you know they. The, the different systems and all sorts of other considerations, but but you know it, China has been growing in the last thirty years, and and there are reasons for that, and and there are also economic research backing that up. Um, basically, yeah, I want to emphasize a few things in China, in, in, you know, in driving this co or closing these gaps, not only in terms of factor uh, supply, inputs, labor, and, and capital, but but one is of connectivity, uh, and in, in order to close the gaps across space, you need to have connectivity, and China has been doing a lot on that front. The second thing is urbanization, which of course is, is fundamental if you want to close the gap between rural and urban productivity. Yeah? And th that's going on very fast. I, I can talk a little more on that because I, I've been actually um, so concerned about, about urbanization in the last six years, but only in the last two years or so, the Chinese government actually come to this picture, come to the conclusion urbanization is important. Actually, back in 2006, I. I give a talk in the, in, in the United Nations. I, I actually that time I, I said, you know, to solve a lot of problems in China, urbanization is the key. And and I think seems looks like you know I got somehow right to some extent. Um, the one issue some of you will know, some of you may not, is this uh, this uh, race to the top thing in China, which is so fundamental to drive China's growth. Uh, some, those who do not want to work on economics, they may not really know. What's happening is this whole political system is actually geared towards driving growth. Now, there are costs. There are issues associated with that. But the, this whole system, even political system, is geared towards growth. And that's so fundamental. And now, China may modify that model to some extent, but drive will be the still main theme. Um, for the you know different levels of government and which is fundamental and important also in the future and there are a lot of reforms reform agendas um, uh, on the agenda whether you know it will carry out or not to what extent that can you know be carried out and that's something uh, we can discuss and one is of course this um, the, the the state owned enterprises um, uh, we had that reform which dragged on for about 10 15 years and earlier was not successful and in one stage they just basically privatized all these medium and small sized SOEs and they keep the, the bigger ones. Now the bigger ones now are producing huge, huge problems. Um, and, and actually that's one I personally, I think uh, the, where one of the major problems for the current leadership is how they can solve that, this kind of, uh, I call it alliance between um, capitalists, the rich and the powerful. And I, you know, personally, I, I, I've been talking to a lot of people, academics and, and, and uh, government officials and private sector. I, I don't, personally, I, I'm not sure how they go about it. Now, uh, after this leadership change, uh, there are some s signs there, but we don't really know whether, because um, every time when they have leadership change, you, you al always see a lot of positive signs, but then in the end, it may not uh, really come to the fru fruition. So, uh, SOE dominance is the area where um, there are also, you know, potentially if the reform can get it right, uh, it will sort of uh, uh, help to uh, to boost growth in China. The other thing is uh, distorted factor prices. We all know that energy and even you know capital, and that's one of the reasons why um, China has been growing. And, uh, but why China is this economy is so unbalanced, even unbalanced externally with the United States in particular, and it goes down really to the factor prices. And in other words. <coughs> really, it's a subsidies, various kinds of subsidies. <coughs> and I think it's time for the government to do something along that line, and that will also help uh, to, to uh, further uh, push the growth. And of course, the financial sector reform, which uh, we related to the subsidies and, and so on. Um, I will leave, of course, apart from within China, you, there is a sort of international or global environment whether you know it's conducive to growth or whether that might pose problems for the Chinese economy, but that's something I will you know leave up to my next speaker, not myself. Um, all right, so let's look at uh, the economic factors. One is of course the labor thing and uh, labor supply, and and if you look at this chart, it's a total dependency ratio. Um, I, what I, I want to tell you is uh, um, we, we know the dependency ratio has been coming down, so that. China has been reaping the, the what they call the demographic dividends. Uh, but many people say, oh, this is coming to an end. But the, the key question is, oh, it will come to the end 
um, eventually. But, but the question is when, and w whether it's right now, next five years, three years. But, but if you look at this chart, it's not going to happen in the next five years or eight years or, or even 10 years, right? So uh, in terms of uh, this uh, dependency ratio, I mean, we can see that you know, in, in the late 70s, you know, if you look at the chart, it's about 65% dependency ratio. And you know, you, for us to, to go back, yeah, for us to go back to about 65%, we, we, we're talking about 2030, even beyond. So you know, in the next still about 20 years, uh, labor supply by and large is even in terms of quantity, pure quantity, uh, is not a big issue. Yeah? You simply look at this chart. The other thing is, of course, is, is uh, this uh, structure or, or aging issue. Uh, um, a lot of people, even myself, has been saying, you know, China is, is you know, getting, um, uh, getting older before they're getting rich. But, but even you look at, at, at this one, which, of course, you got to pay attention to the top, top curve, which is the, the, the labor force. That determines the labor supply, the proportion of labor force in the population. And, and again, you, you need to compare, you know, when the China study reform, which is in the, in the late 70s and, and, and the early 80s, it's, again, it's about 60% yeah, of the labor force. And for China to, to go down to about 60%, we, again, we talk about 2020. Yeah. So we still have, uh, again, uh, you know, about 10 years to go. Um, and, and, you know, there are other factors, of course, I, I'm coming to. But, but overall, in terms of labor supply, in, in the medium run, it, it, it's, to me, it's not going to be a huge problem. Uh, constraining growth. Um, then, of course, quantity is one issue, and, and, and that's uh, the question some economists, including myself, are trying to argue, okay, China will become aging society pretty soon, and, and labor supply will, you know, we, we, we face, we're already facing shortages in some areas, and, and, you know, after 15, 20 years, China may have a problem with labor supply. But quantity is only one issue. The, the other issue is really the quality. And if you look at this chart, which is quite, uh, uh, Striking, it's the number of graduates, a and we know that um, you know from from the early 2000s. Actually, people have been complaining, says many graduates, bachelor's degree students cannot find jobs, and then you know in the 2005, six, you know, particularly after the you know the crisis, the global crisis, even bachelor's students cannot find jobs. Um, my my view is that it, it whether this is a long run problem or it's a short run problem. I mean that that's the question we got to ask ourselves. Um, in terms of labor supply or skill supply, I mean, there are two ways. The market can work. So the market will have signals, say there's shortage in IT, in, in finance. Then the labor supply, the, the higher institutions, higher education institutions will prov provide that kind of training and so on. But that's going to take time. Education is not, cap not like capital flow. You know, it's a, you, know, you press one key, the capital goes, and you know, after a few months, a year, it, it actually get into actual practical use. But education skill is not that way. It takes m many, many years um, to, to come up if there's a shortage. And, and the you know, alternative is you, know, you have the skills in the economy, and, and uh, now you, in the short term, you may have oversupply, but you may, you know, when there's a demand for that, you already have that skills there. And that's something I do have, uh, you know, I don't like the unemployment for, for you know, uh, graduates and, and so on. It's always a problem whether the university graduates or non-graduates. But, but uh, uh, we've got to look at that in a dynamic view. And, and China need, must upgrade. If you don't upgrade, there's no future for the Chinese government. And to upgrade skills are, are fun so fundamental. And we cannot wait until there's such a demand to, to provide these skills. And here we see this chart there. I'm not sure whether that's deliberately in the leadership, you know, in the government um, sort of agenda, but, but at least this picture shows that this skill supply in China is growing very, very fast, much faster than the economy. And at sh in the short term, they may create some problem, but I believe in the medium round may be good for the economy. And similarly for engineering graduates, a lot of people are doing comparison between China and India, and they look at engineer uh, graduates of en engineers. And again, we see this trend uh, in the sort of early 2000s, and it's a huge, very fast increase in, in the graduates uh, of engineering and non-engineering. Uh, non and so this is labor supply. We believe you know, the, in terms of quantity, they have plenty in the, in the medium term, and, and even in terms of quality, we, we even it's even more promising. And what about capital? Well, the first thing, of course, uh, m many of us will know is China actually saves quite a lot. They, they, they have too much capital. Uh, and we can see this here. This is the uh, gr gross savings rate. Um, you know, it's, it goes um, from 
sort of uh, uh, bit high 30s in, in the 2000s now into the mid of 50s and, and that's something I don't know whether the, whether you know ever happening in the other economy you, you save more than 50 percent of what you produce and uh, well of course it, it's a problem but on the other hand it does provide a lot of capital uh, for, for the economy um, I come back to this issue uh, because it's it's a double-edged uh, sort, of, uh, sort of sword and and it really depending on how you look at it but from the investment point of view, from the capital support point of view, it's a good thing. And here's China has huge household deposit, and that's another problem. But on the other, other hand, it's also supply, depending which angle you look at. Um, and you know, we talk about over 30 trillion deposit in the Chinese economy. And uh, that's, of course, uh, the potential for, uh, for capital formation for investment. And here's the foreign capital. Apart from domestic capital, we've got to look at the foreign capital. And, and, and uh, as we can see, the, the FDI, foreign direct investment, still continue to increase in absolute values. Uh, these are the bars. You can see continue growth um, even you know, during the crisis period in terms of absolute values. Yeah. Um, and the, the red line actually it shows the, the FDR, the ratio of FDR to total GDP. We see that actually it's, it's been declining. It's, uh, it's been declining overall since the mid-90s, and that's where I'm saying China is actually relying more and more on, on domestic capital. Yeah, in, in that sense, and we have plenty of domestic capital. Foreign capitals are important. The absolute amount also increasing as well, n not in terms of, of the ratio. Um, now, that's a very important um, uh, 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 chart here. Um, China has been trying to, to you know, divert resources to inland China from the coastal areas, but for quite a long time, it, it, it has not been, it, it wasn't really happening. And the one signal we can look at is really the FDI. Um, you know, the, the here is what's happening. We, we see again the, the three, the four regions in China. This, this are these three lines corresponding to the four regions in China. We we have this top one, which is the eastern or the coastal part. Then we have the other three, you know, inland, you know, northeast, uh, central, and the west. What do we see here <coughs> is, you know, uh, in terms of FDI, yeah. FDI, because that's the important signal where you know the, the technology um, sort of uh, input uh, import will be, where the you know learning will take place, yeah. and you can see there's such a you know obvious convergence in terms of FDI across different regions. See, by uh, 2009, um, actually uh, the, the the in terms of this ratio ratio, actually central China's FDI is higher than the eastern part. Now, the eastern part is still higher than western and northwest, but the gaps are much, much smaller, and it's getting uh, smaller. And, and uh, that means um, there's a potential. I mean, foreign investors are going to the west, going to the central, and there are reasons for that. You know, we've got to trust. You know, they have their, they have their assessments uh, before they actually move up. And for quite a long, long time, actually, China has been struggling, and, and it's only until very recently um, this, we have this cross line between central and, and, and eastern China. And that's where I'm a bit optimistic. For quite a long time, I've been doubtful because when a you know, foreign investor goes to China, they only not only look at cheap labor, but also they got to look at cultural factors, connectivity, and, and the environment, and so on. A and that's why for a long time, we have doubts. But now, uh, from this chart, we can see something positive are, are happening. And um, we, we talk about connectivity, and I think I don't have to tell you how much China has been investing in the connectivity. It's, it's dramatic, it's huge. It's still forthcoming, I mean, despite some problems in the last couple of years when the Minister of Railways was, you know, was uh, arrested, and, and, uh, but it's coming back. We already see that, and I think China will continue to invest in that. And uh, here's, we talk about capital, and then I, I said China is not only talking about capital, but we're moving from capital to innovation. And here's R&D. Um, uh, the, the bars actually shows the actual amount, which, of course, increasing dramatically. The red line is, is actually the ratio to GDP. And we know the Chinese economy has grown about 9-10% per annum. And here's the ratio. And we can see you know, China has, you know, has uh, gone from about 0.7% in the mid-90s to about 1.5% of GDP in R&D investment, which is quite huge, doubled in terms of the percentage. And you've got to remember that the GDP has been growing at almost double digits you know, for quite a long time. So if you go to China, I, I was saying to um, 
uh, at one stage, you know, earlier, the Chinese academics, because being uh, economists, you know, you're always looking for foreign partners to, to provide some research uh, funding, even for a conference. Now you go to China, it, it just funds abounds and, 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 and you, you don't have trouble in, in, in getting research funding, but you only have trouble in spending them. It's a serious problem. You, you have a lot of trouble. I mean, myself included. You can so easily get a lot of funding, but how do you spend them? It becomes a big issue. And actually, it's a good thing because uh, nowadays it's getting harder and harder to manipulate the system. So maybe some of you know, some of you may not know. Uh, the, the system actually becoming more complete, uh, uh, more sort of rule-based, and, and it makes sort of manipulations much more difficult. Uh, and you know, on one hand, that's a good thing uh, for the for the society. And here's the innovation, the indicator of of patents. That's the number of patents. And, and again, we don't have to look at the number, but just look at the the huge trend. We, we see it here, uh, and uh, there are a lot of research uh, on this front as well. Um, so we look at R and D. That's the input for innovation. We look at the outputs uh, of innovation, and and it's also we can see the clearly see that trend. And this, of course, is fundamental. And, uh, and I believe, of course. For mature economies like the United States, that's virtually the only thing. You push the frontier. That's where the innovation. But for China, we have both. You have the catching up of those spaces we already, already discussed, but you also have this sort of you know, uh, in innovation and, uh, and, and uh, you know, research and, and development uh, there as well. And that trend, uh, I believe, will continue. So these are, really, these are the supply side issues, and, and I think we probably have you know, more in common in, in agreeing that China won't have supply problem. They have a lot of capacity. China can expand if they produce. But the main problem lies really on, on the demand side, whether, you know, there are demand for what they produce. And, of course, that's where the, you know, when we have this crisis period, China, uh, you know, is having problems. But, but again, uh, you know, we've got to look at, uh, I'm, I said, you know, I, I like to look at the, you know, medium term, not really in the short run. In the short run, you know, things, uh, if you do something, it takes time to materialize. So let's look at some of the um, sort of medium run uh, prospect. And of course, for China, you have the global demand and, and, and the domestic demand issue. Uh, global demand, we don't have to really, you know, discuss. Um, I mean, one thing, of course, we all know is this appreciation of this Chinese currency, about 35% since 2005 and it's still continuing in the last few weeks, very growing pretty fast. And, and of, on the other hand, the, the wages in China are growing very fast as well. That, and that, that's partly driven by this shortage of labor in the coastal areas. Um, and this sort of from both sides, um, uh, so where, that's where you know, they have problems with exports. Uh, and and uh, I believe they will continue to have problems and, uh, on, on the international market, you know, to the United States, the, of course, you, you have some problem in Europe. I mean, these are the two largest destinations for, for China's export. You have a problem, but I, I believe, you know, you, you will recover, and whether, you know, to what extent or how fast, but definitely, you, we all know that it will recover. Crisis comes and goes. Um, but despite that, um, I think uh, China will have problems. Even you recover because of this appreciation, because of the wage rise, um, um, uh, China will have problem in, in exporting. Um, so we've got to look at domestic demand, and domestic demand is the issue Chinese government has been working on, at least as I remember since the late 90s. Um, I actually wrote paper, published a paper in 1997 looking at that uh, issue why China cannot boost domestic demand. So you have to export about 50% of your commodities to outside. Actually, you might think this is really dramatic, but it is true. If you take away the service export, it's about half of GDP. Take with the services. It's every two tables you produce, one is consumed outside. Every two glasses you produce, one is exported, which is, um, uh, is problematic. Um, <coughs> I mean, we already seen this right now in, in, in front of us. So we've got to come to the domestic demand. Um, domestic demand has been declining as well. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, as I said, you know, in the late 90s, I already you know, put my eyes on that, and we haven't really solved that. Um, there are couple of main issues why the domestic demand has been declining. One is the, the labor share of GDP, you know, how much the, the, the employees get, apart from those with capital, apart from the, the enterprises and apart from the government. I mean, you know, the, the, the division of what, to what you produce. And that share, we'll see that it's been declining in the last 10, 
uh, 12 years and, and quite a dramatic decline. And then the other thing is risks. China has been a sort of command system in the past and reforms get rid of a lot of this command system, but on the other hand, you introduce a lot of risks on health, on education, on, you know, on housing, and, and the people have got to you know, save for that. They, this is precautionary savings. And that's, of course, they save, then they consume less, and it's due to reform. Reform is go was good for growth, but reform was, uh, I don't know whether it was good for consumption. And earlier, they did not pay much attention to that. Now we are paying the price. And another issue particular is housing. Um, I mean, we know the problem with the housing sector. Uh, and one issue people did not pay much attention is this housing issue with consumption. And there are more recent research looking at that issue, why you know, people are saving so much, uh, and housing is a huge factor there, which has been ignored by a lot of people. And of course, um, you know, when the, the, the 2007 crisis came and the international community and, and international community development institutions like ADB and even the you know, Chinese government saying, you know, oh, we've got to change the, you know, China must boost demand and, and change that. But I said right there as, as an economist, you know, we know that changing this kind of thing takes a long, long time. It doesn't really happen overnight. It, you got to do a lot of things, and, and, and the change will be slow. So um, that's why I, you know, I'm, I do have a lot of uh, concerns and reservations about on the, on the demand side, on the, on the cons consumption side. But there are reasons to be optimistic. And um, let, let me come to that um, just, just in a little while. Here is the chart to show where the problems are. Um, the, the top, on the top is the household consumption, right? You can see the declining, uh, actual dramatic, accelerated decline in the, in, the in the share where the household gets the consumption in, in the total economy. Yeah? It dropped in the early 2000s. I mean, we remember the housing reform study in the mid 90s, maybe 97 and so on, it actually, you know, in a large scale, you know, really at, at about that time. Um, it, it was going on for quite a long time, but on a large scale was really about late 90s and, and early 2000. And we can see the, the drop in the household, in the top curve, you can see that. It, it dropped uh, from about 50, I think 46%, that's right, to about 34%. So the household, share uh, in the economy is only about one third of the whole economy. It dropped about 12% uh, in, in the last 10 years or so. That's a dramatic drop. But on the other hand, if we look at the, 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 you know, the blue curve, where is the, the, the lower, lower one, uh, around 16%, this is the government share in the economy. What do we see? I know we know that the government revenue has been growing so fast some, you know, like Beijing government at one stage, they stopped collecting taxes in October. They know what, you know why? Because they said we're collecting too much. So they stopped it. The, the revenue has been increasing at double, you know, about 20%, 22% for many years. So they accumulate a lot of revenues. Um, but then what we can see is the government revenue or government consumption spending actually also declined. Not so much, but also declined by three points, three percentage points yeah, in the same period. And that's why here, uh, where I, I'm a bit more optimistic, if, if you combine these two curves with uh, the fact that you know, research <coughs> find that a lot of uh, earnings are retained by enterprises rather than by, by households, then I'm a bit more optimi optimistic. Being a sort of mixed market and command economy, the, the government is very powerful. They can certainly spend more to make up the decline. They can also push the enterprises because we know particularly the big enterprises made a lot of money, uh, not necessarily because they are competitive. And that's the, where the government can do something about it. So that's where I think as long as the government really take it very seriously, they can do something about it. So that's from this picture. Um, I mentioned the housing. Um, Research, recent research, a, a friend of mine down research from Peking University said, you know, he looked at the, the consumption drops and, and, you know, what explained that from various angles. And the housing thing, he believes, according to his research, explains about 60% to 70% of the decline in household consumption. Now, one thing the Chinese government has been doing and will continue to do is the public housing. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a headache, it's a huge issue in my mind. I, I, I've been asking Ron, you know, Overseas and inside China, about this housing sector in, China, uh, in the urban areas, um, a, a lot of issues. I, I don't have, a, you know, a, a, a clear answer to that. But but one thing we know that in the next 
five years, the Chinese government is committed to building about 36 million public housing units. And you know, if you look at you know in the, in the medium term, you know, to talk about 15, 20 years, we talk about hundreds, hundred million or more than hundred million public housing units. And of course, they have the finance uh, to do that. And that uh, it's not only the provision of housing; it, it's the Im implication of housing provision for consumption. That that's the point I want to make because. 60% of decline, we saw those diagrams, um, is, is due to this, you know, people are safe for buying housing. The housing price has been, you know, skyrocketing in China. And the provision of this will help um, to, to a significant extent. We don't know to what extent, but we know that will be helpful. The, the another issue which has been ignored, I, I want to do some research on in the last two or three years, but I haven't got to that, is this age savings nexus. Now, there's a term in China they call it zero savings generation, or they call it yu guangzu, or you know you, you you don't have savings. Every month you get the, you you know get whatever you paid, you spend them all. You you are good if you don't ask your parents, right? But 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 you know th this uh, issue very very serious. Actually, I, I was going to write a paper for the Chinese government. Said you know Chinese government says everybody got to con increase consumption, buy more, you know save less. But well, in the end, you know, we know uh, any, any economy need savings, need investment to drive its growth, uh, and even the United States as well. But I mean, China at the moment saves a lot for various reasons. But but we know that China is f aging quite fast. At, at the the young generation, this zero savings generation is becoming household hate. They become the decision makers very soon. You know, the post 80s, post 90s are becoming household hates, um, and that's where I believe the, this consumption will pick up. And that's so fundamental because they have a total, totally different philosophy regarding consumption and savings. And that's where I believe, you know, every year they have a large amount of this young generation become decision makers regarding consumption and saving. And that's very important. And the other issue is social safety net. Now, I mean, we know China in a, ref, uh, you know, in the planned period, uh, they only very, very, very little social safety net for the urban sector. And rural sector was zero but they started to introduce that in 2006. Actually, we see the impact. This provision of social safety net is so important. One, of course, is try to contain the risk uncertainty in the economy, which will help reduce the precautionary savings I you know, mentioned earlier. The other thing, quite important, which is also very important for, for, for consumption, is on inequality, which is the, the area I personally worked in the last 10 years. You know, I, I published you know, some papers on that. And, and I been always say, saying that actually inequality is one of the factors why you know, China is not really consuming so much because the rich, they don't consume anymore because they've been consuming more than what they should consume. And the, the poor, a, a large, huge amount, they can, simply cannot afford consuming. I mean, you may know that China still have about 120, 130 million people living below dollar twenty-five a day. Dollar five a day, what can you get in the urban sector? You know, you, a box of lunch you will, will, will cost more than a dollar in urban areas. So you, you have this huge, you know, sort of dif divide in the society. And the social safety, we know that hopefully they're targeting the, the bottom section of the population. And they, that's where, you know, all this spending, the government spending will go to consumption rather than they cannot save. I mean, they got to consume, right? So that's where social safety, but it's only started in 2006, and they've been accelerating. And it's a very small amount, but it's actually they, they, they're pushing forward, uh, and that's where I believe will help uh, uh, consumption um, pretty fast. And the other issue is urbanization. Uh, now, urbanization, of course, is important for, you know, um, for people's income, for the growth itself, but also it's good for consumption simply because, if, you know, if you do a research, look at the consumption, consumption behavior between urban and rural people, you will find rural people are, you know, tend to save more. Even they have lower income, the urban people spend more because they are urban people. Um, and and they, they, they have different behaviors. And you know, I, I wanted to do some research on that, look at that impact, but there are research being done. Not only look at urban and rural, even there are differences between three groups of population in China the, in terms of consumption behavior or savings behavior. One is the urban people, uh, they earn more, uh, they earn more, they spend more. Then you have this rural people, they earn less, they spend less. But there's another group which is quite big, which are the migrants. We talk about, well, we only talk about 200 million, um, who earns in the middle, they spend very little. They send 
a lot of child back to the rural areas where they were built house and, and you know for the <coughs> kids and so on and so on. They don't spend much at all. There is huge difference. I mean, why they don't spend much? They send back because to them, urban is not their home. So they, they, they got to think about it, they go back. But if the Chinese government can do reform, very serious reform, said you were settled in the urban areas, they were spent more. Yeah. And, and I believe, I hope, the current leadership will do this very, very fast. Um, because to me, I will come back to that in the challenges. I think this 200 million migrants is a big, big social, political, economic issue in China. It, it's not financial ref reform. It's not corruption. It's these 200 million migrants, which is a time bomb for the Chinese society. And it has a lot of implications um, on all fronts. Um, all right. So um, that's the urbanization part. Um, and, and also, this, uh, on, even on trade front, um, I, I put at the last point, um, uh, I, I believe um, China has a potential to increase inter Asia trade because we know Asia is growing. Not only China, but other Asia, other parts of Asia uh, are growing as well. We, China got to really look into inter Asia trade to compensate for the potential loss, um, you know, external trade you know, with the EU and and, and uh, United States. I think I, I'm probably going to skip some of the diagrams in terms, you know, to, to save time. Here is the social safety net. I mean, we can see again it's the total amount, absolute amount in the bars and. And the, the line, the red line is, is a ratio um, to GDP. You can see dramatic, dramatic. See, can it's they started really sort of you know in the late 90s, but but the actual spending increase, uh, particularly for the rural people, it's really in, it's about 2006, and that's where the problems are to us. So that's social net, uh, safe net spending. Uh, that's a consumption gap between rural and the, you know, urban people, and I said urbanization will continue, and will continue, hopefully, will continue at an even larger scale than before, um, depending on the government policy, and that's a gap. If they do, then that will help boost consumption because it's a huge difference in consumption. You know, we talk about more than double, about three times difference, which is quite huge. And here's the, 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 the economic structure where we know that the service sector is, uh, China has been struggling with the service sector development. Uh, one of the two indicators or, or achievement targets China did not achieve in the last five-year plan. One is the environment, one is the service sector. And, and to me, it's uh, the problem lies in urbanization they, because they did not really push urbanization. They've been so cautious. They've been really sort of hesitating regarding urbanization. So, um, but as the service sector uh, take more shares in the economy, they will consume more because we know that uh, commodities are more tradable than services. And a lot of services are local, and you know you got to be consumed. So as the service sector develops, uh, they will consume more than otherwise. And that's the export uh, share to to Europe, United States, and Asia. One one thing you can see is the share wi within Asia it has been declining quite a lot, you know, for for many years, and and uh, that represents potential because Asia has been growing, and in terms of growth, it's it, 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 it's actually faster than Europe and the United States. So that that represents potential. I'm I'm going to. Um, I mean, actually, imports from Asia is growing, which is quite uh, interesting because you know they, they import more from Asia, but they export much less and you know declining. And that's where I say potential. You import more, you can also export more to to Asian, you know, within Asian, and that's where we have the potential. And one thing, uh, evidence of picking up in consumption due to those promising trends, I just you know, uh, or the arguments I, I put forward is you can see this chart. That's the Retail sale of consumer goods, you know, one of the indicators of, of consumption. You can see dramatic increases, the slope, you know, so steep recently, and that indicates uh, the growth in, in, in consumption. Uh, of course, that's still not enough, but, but it's, it's huge increases. And here is the growth rate difference between GDP and retail sale. And, and you know, since about 2000, in the last 10 years, it, the, the consumption growth, the retail sale growth, has been always above the GDP growth. And we know GDP growth in the last 10 years even higher than in the previous years. It's uh, over 10%. So retail sales, we're talking about probably 12, 13% per annum, which is quite a dramatic. And that will continue um, uh, in the medium run. So uh, overall, I, I am optimistic. Uh, but there are you know, many problems, which I think most of us, many of us, or all of us will know. Um, one is this, all these imbalances, external balance, particularly with the United States. And we have internal balance, imbalance, you know, between consumption and the production, between coastal areas, inland areas, between rural and urban areas, and so on and so on. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's fairly well known. The other issue is aging. And, uh, but personally, I, I'm not really worrying too much about aging as long as you can really improve the hum human capital 
Um, I don't know how much, I haven't really done the research to actually to figure out really how much labor force China need, but I believe uh, the skill content of labor force is more important than the quantity, uh, and you know productivity is fundamental. Corruption, I also put a question mark there. Um, I put a question mark there is one is I'm not sure you know it's no good. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying corruption is good, but 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 uh, in terms of growth potential, China has been you know experiencing this problem for a long time. <coughs> uh, it's not today. Actually, I, I actually published two pieces uh, uh, this year on this corruption issue. Uh, many people actually, I mean, one general did not take it because they, th they think I got it wrong, but, but I, I, I think, I mean, at least we can argue, corruption, actually, whether it's getting worse or getting better, that's the issue. It is serious, it was serious, it is very, very, very serious now, and it might be still very, very serious you know, in the short term. But the key question is, we gotta look at is the, the trend, is getting better or not, or it's getting worse? And according to my research, actually, it's getting better. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some statistics, even you look at the transparency uh, in the national index. So, I mean, that, that's the thing, you know, I, I um, do. But, but a serious uh, corruption is very serious. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's one issue. Uh, I, I believe uh, it's, it's improving. The other thing, you know, corruption in China, there are economists saying it actually helps get things done. So that, that's the difference between corruption in China and, and some other countries. You know, the corrupt officials, they are corrupted, but they get your things done if they receive bribes. But in some other countries, it's not the case. They, they get bribes, they don't get things done. And that's a very important difference. Um, the other issue is inequality, and that's the area I worked on. It, it is very, very serious. Um, but if you look at the chart, I mean, I can show you if you like. Uh, again, since 2006, they, they actually, the, the inequality has been coming down consecutively. In the, in the last about five years. Now, my, as someone who, who has some expertise to some extent, actually I'm not sure whether this is the declining trend, the, the beginning of the long run declining trend, I'm not sure, but it has, it has been declining in quality, and, and that's a good thing. From all sorts of different perspectives, it, it's very good. Um, but it remains very high, very, very high, and remains a serious problem China got to tackle, and, and, uh, and I believe urbanization, as I mentioned. Is a, is a case, and the good thing is that the, the forthcoming prime minister putting s so much emphasis on urbanization, which was so surprising to me because I've been talking in, in China, of, you know, every opportunity I have, I, got, I say urbanization, urbanization, but, but uh, uh, you know, I did not see the government pick it up. Even two years ago, uh, last year, you know, I did not see that, but you know, since this year, the forthcoming prime minister is, every place he goes, he talk about urbanization. So I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, becoming more positive. And the, the last thing I want to talk is this people uh, called cron crony capitalism. Uh, that's where the, the, the alliance between, um, between the rich and the powerful, and uh, I don't have a solution. I've been talking just before I came here. I was at a major, very important uh, 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 event in the Great Hall of China, and uh, Justin Lin, the, the previous chief economist of the World Bank, was there. I, I was talking to him because to me, um, I said, you know, I, I've been thinking and thinking we can propose different solutions, but I, I couldn't figure out um, uh, what China can do. Um, I mean, he, he mentioned, you know, one thing he mentioned is the subsidies, but uh, personally, I don't see subsidies, removing subsidies is important, but I still don't see how remo removing subsidies will solve this, this alliance between um, power and, and the rich, and, and that's where the problems are, and, and um, uh, that's the area I, I'm quite concerned. And, and, the, and lastly, I want to come back to these 200 million migrants. Um, this 200 million migrants is a big number. Um, this whole group is being discriminated by the system, by the government. It's not discri only discriminated by the market. Um, f this um, group of people has, has existed in China since the late, mid, late 80s. And the, the number has been increasing, but it's been there. Uh, so there are economists, including Fang Gang, who is a prominent figure, you know, talks all over the world. And, and uh, even last year in March, we, we had a um, workshop in Peking, Beijing University, and where he, he went to give a talk. He also mentioned it's a good thing in China, you know, when they, things get better, you have plenty of labor supply, things getting worse, these people come back to rural areas. I, I said, Fang Gang, well, you know, as economists, you, you don't really look at a <coughs> from a st static point of view, you've got to look at, at the dynamic point of view. Do you realize this group of people is not the same people anymore? As time goes from late 80s to now, we talk about 20 years, and this composition of this market changes dramatically. 
now this post 80, like you know 30, below 30 pe years old, you know, compose about 60 percent, more than 60 percent, and that percentage is increasing every day. And these people are so different from their parents because for various reasons. One, they are better educated, they're more liberal, they have access to outside in information. Most importantly, they have different mentality. No longer like their previous, like their parents. They believe urban area is also belong to them. It's it's not something you know only belong belong to the urban areas. They believe they have the rights to urban life, and and most most importantly, they cannot go back to rural life anymore. And that was clearly shown during the crisis period. They simply simply cannot survive. They don't like. They cannot survive. Even they want to go back to the rural areas. They have. They cannot survive. And when survival become the issue, and if the system, if the government continue to discriminate against them, and if they cannot survive, things will happen. And that's why I said, you know, that's a time bomb, and China must solve that ahead of anything else very, very fast. Otherwise, you know, um, this prospect uh, will be doomed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wan. You have flooded us with uh, statistics and information. Um, Peter, can you? Uh, much time give us give some us. insights. I'll give you as much as you need, but uh, it'd be nice to leave a little uh, time for uh, is this for on? questions this and on. answers. <coughs> well, thank you for including me. Thank you, Dr. Wan, for an extraordinarily rich set of slides and information and comments. You focused mostly on the medium term, and I agree with you. There are many reasons uh, to believe that. Uh, China's gross prospects for some another 10, 15 years are pretty reasonable. You stayed away from making any particular projections very wisely. <laughs> um, you focus mostly on the medium term. Let me make some comments on the, on the near term prospects. Uh, but before I do so on the medium term, um, I've been watching China now and trying to understand the economy on a daily basis for almost 20 years. And I must say, my level of confidence about my own knowledge hasn't improved in the meantime. <laughs> this is such a big place and changing so fast that at best we can understand part of, of the story. And we can highlight those parts of the story we think we understand and then present a certain picture. But I would like to emphasize, before I go to the short term, that there are huge medium-term uncertainties also, not just short term. Uh, the biggest, I think, is internal political reform in China. Um, I don't know what that means, but I share the widely held opinion that some form of political reform is now on the critical path, that the degree of discontent and uneasiness about the current situation has become quite, quite strong. Uh, I saw a recent uh, Pew poll uh, on China which reported that about one-third of the respondents believe that their children would not have a better life than themselves, which for China is a huge increase and worries, worrisome. Uh, the other uncertainties that you didn't mention but we all know about, of course, are what's happening to the climate. Uh, global warming is progressing much faster than we thought we were, according to a report that came out yesterday. What will the economic consequences be for China, especially the coastal zones? Uh, what will China's relationship be with its most important international partners, the US, the Euro Europeans, and the Japan? If that is mismanaged, I think all bets are off. You didn't focus on that, but I would just like to emphasize that in the medium term projections, all sorts of things can happen that uh, could cloud up the picture. But I agree with you, with your initial comments, that China's gross performance since the early, since the late 70s has consistently been better than even the most optimistic <laughs> forecasters had predicted. So with that historical fact in mind, we, we can perhaps be a bit more optimistic than uh, many people are at the present time. Among the many factors that you identify to underpin your relative confidence, there's one missing. And I would like to put that on the table, and that's the quality of economic management in China which if you look, if you compare it with other large emerging economies, India, Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, has been pretty good. On the whole, China's economic managers have managed this 
this ship rather well. And if we, if we can assume that the same quality of management will project continue in the future, that's another factor underlying your relative optimism. Now, more on the short term. Um, many people have worried that the slowdown that started actually at the beginning of 2010, if you measure it on a month-on-month -month basis, not year-on-year -year basis, so that's been going on for almost two years now, uh, was the prelude to a fundamental problem, that China would slow down to 2 or 3%, and that the end of the bonanza was now near. Um, many people even predicted a hard landing, a crash in the, in, the real, in the property sector and so on. None of that has happened. Uh, I believe that all these short-term misery projections were vastly overdone. Uh, all, all current indications are that the decline has bottomed out and that the fourth quarter of 2012 will show higher growth than, say, the previous two or three quarters. I expect uh, total GDP growth for 2012 to come out at about 7.7, 7.8. And I also believe that the pickup that we are currently observing will continue, certainly in the first half of next year. So it's, it's not unreasonable to expect, barring international or national disasters, that 2013 will show 8.2% 8, 8 growth, which is pretty good. It would still be the highest in the world. And, um, but beyond that, almost all prognosticators suggest declining growth rates. And we have to understand why almost everybody agrees on, the, on that prospect. You didn't really turn, uh, uh, discuss that in detail. Let me identify the main reasons why it is reasonable to expect that a short-term uptick in 2013 will be followed by slower growth thereafter, going down to perhaps, according to the World Bank, 5% in about 20 years' time. The, the big 2030 report projects, um, and I have it here, going down from to 5% after 2025. So not no dramatic decline, but still decline. Uh, why is that? Um, conventional growth accounting that economists do um, looking at the input side, that is labor, capital, and the efficiency of production, um, suggest that there will be no gross input uh, uh, stimulus anymore from increased labor. Labor force is about to peak, so that will become a negative factor. The only positive one is the quality of labor, and as you pointed out, that will continue to increase and become a hugely important positive factor. On the capital side, most people agree that the returns on capital have actually been declining in recent years, <laughs> and that you would have to, in order to maintain the same crazily high growth rates of, of recent years, increase even further the capital GDP ratio. Since the capital GDP ratio, investment GDP ratio, is already an unprecedented, off the charts, 50% of GDP, nobody in his right <coughs> mind would, would project that capital can support even higher growth or maintain the 10% plus growth rates in the past. What about efficiency? In the long term, as you also pointed out, productivity growth, in particular total factor productivity, is the single most important factor. Now, China has had extraordinarily high efficiency growth, but mainly on the back of catching up with the rest of the world. That is obviously a temporary phenomenon. In sector after sector, China is beginning to approach the, uh, the technology frontiers, and from then on, further rapid efficiency growth depends on domestic innovation, which has not been one of China's strong points in the past. If the government, if China is successful in, through R&D spending and so on, in increasing the, the contribution of domestic innovation, then it is reasonable to assume that efficiency growth will continue, but that's a big if at this point. So with, with great support for your broad sentiment, your, the, the broad optimism you made plausible, there are a number of caveats that we have to uh, bear in mind. Um, you, I also fu fully agree with you with the central importance of urbanization. The rate and the quality of urbanization are going to be extremely important for the 
quality for the rate and quality of growth. And there have been many problems with that in the present time. Mr. Kim, the new World Bank president, was in Beijing last week at the meeting with the uh, uh, forthcoming prime minister, Li Keqiang, now the deputy premier, who, and they are, all they talked about was urbanization. That was the sole subject of, uh, of discussion. And I agree that that's terribly important. The, the congestion in China's major cities, and Beijing is, of course, we all know, is just absolutely horrible now and can become a major burden, a cost burden on the economy if that is repeated in city after city. Um, with regard to the rebalancing, which was another point you emphasized, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding on that point. And in fact, you, you pointed out some of yourself, but your charts show the different picture of what you actually said. You, your charts show, show the, the well-known decline in the consumption GDP ratio to 34% last year or the year before. Now, many people believe there's a huge consumption problem in China because of that. But that's a huge misunderstanding um, for two reasons. A, as you also pointed out, housing, spending by households on housing, uh, rents, housing purchase, mortgages are excluded from consumption. And there has been a huge shift in the way Chinese households are spending their money in the last 15 years from all sorts of non-durable consumption goods to durable consumption goods, in particular housing. If you were to include, if you were to change the statistics and include all the spending on housing and consumption expenditures, household consumption expenditures as a percentage of GDP remains remarkably flat. So it's a statistical problem. Ch China's consumption, domestic consumption growth has been the fastest in the world for any major economy for at least a decade. There is no consumption problem in China. The problem has been overinvestment. That's the problem. If we can bring the investment GDP rate, growth rate down, as it should because of the declining returns, the ratio of consumption to GDP will come all right automatically. Don't worry about it. It's not really a problem. It's been completely misunderstood by many, many observers. On the external imbalances, which was not a strong focus of your presentation, I think we see a similar relatively optimistic picture. 2007 was the year of maximum imbalances for China. The current account surplus as a percentage of GDP was off the charts. It's a little over 10% of GDP. But it came down to 2.7% of GDP last year. I expect it to go up marginally to about 3% this year, but then down again. And all sorts of reasons that I have no time to go into to support a relative optimism on the rebalancing of China's economy, which over time, Will make, it, will make the Chinese economy look like a more normal economy than it has been in, uh, in recent years. On the demographics, I totally agree with you. These dependency ratios are bending up, but it will be a while before that will become a, an important cost factor. Um, on um, the, the South-South trade, the intra-Asian trade, I fully agree with you. Uh, even if the US continues to sort of move along at 2 or 3% two or growth and Europe doesn't get out of the recession and Japan troubles continue, uh, the, the prospects for China exports are still relatively bright because of the South-South Strait. Already, pe most people haven't realized that already almost 60% of China's exports is, is outside the US, Europe, and Japan. It's to fellow developing countries, particularly in Asia, but increasingly Latin America and Africa. So don't worry too much about the export picture, even if the US uh, continues to slow growth. Let me leave my comments on that so that you, I have a lot more, but you have some time <laughs> for, the, for discussion. <laughs> I would normally ask you to, re, uh, to respond, Dr. Wan, but I would like to give the audience an opportunity to, uh, to raise some questions. Uh, the question on my mind, I won't pose it as a question, but it has to do with the fact that the top economic leaders in China, uh, Premier Wen Jiabao, has been calling the Chinese economy unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, unsustainable. And uh, President Hu Jintao 
picked up on that language in his work report at the 18th Party Congress, saying that uh, the unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable development was still a big problem for China. The second issue, which we haven't touched on, is this question of the middle income trap. Uh, uh, and at least some observers feel that China, in order to escape the trap, has to grow at at least 6.6% .6 annually. And there are some projections that say that China may be able to do that up to 2030, but only on the basis of fundamental reforms in its economic system. But then the third question, which you referred to, is the corruption issue. And the problem is the corruption has now permeated the very top levels of the Communist Party. Uh, I saw the report of a Bloomberg study which noted that the top 80 wealthiest people in the National People's Congress had wealth that was over 10 times larger than the top 660 U.S. government officials in the U.S. government. Uh, a, a, a surprising figure, I, I, I must say. Uh, the question is, can a communist party, which has been corrupted right up to the very top in terms of wealth, carry out the fundamental economic reforms that are necessary for China to sustain the growth levels necessary to escape the middle income trap? Uh, the middle income trap is when you lose the advantages of low cost labor and have to substitute innovation or some other uh, alternative way of stimulating rapid growth. Uh, and that's a problem which over 90% of countries, or at least over 85% of countries, fail at. Uh, I think the statistic I've seen is that of the 101 middle income countries in 1970, only 13 had reached high income levels by 2008, which is not a very good uh, success ratio. So those are the sort of questions on my mind that go through it. But let's throw the question, uh, the floor open for questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, okay. No. Okay. Well, I'll still talk at it. Um, I, I, your presentation, which sort of looked at the supply side and then the more briefly on the demand side, uh, I perceive a potential disconnect between the two sides in that on the supply side, you have charts that show great labor productivity growth uh, throughout the country. But then when you look at the demand side and in implicitly you look at the distribution of the income, you yourself talk about high retained earnings in the corporate sector. Basically, it doesn't look like the labor sector is getting full remuneration for their productivity growth, that their wages are lagging behind productivity growth which could feed into, although, Peter, I think you're correct in pointing out the statistical anomaly and in not including housing, one of the reasons why you're not getting the consumption jump that you would expect inside China, simply because the consuming sector of the economy isn't getting remunerated. This also could, in part, feed into the income distribution, which you didn't talk much about, uh, the rising Gini coefficient, um, the disparity even within the urban population, even within the rural population and then also could fit in with your, you could argue that there isn't much difference between corruption and crony capitalism, that crony capitalism is a form of corruption, which would feed into uh, Ambassador uh, Roy's comment about the leadership. So I was wondering if you could comment, if you've looked at the actual distribution of income, not so much in terms of high-low, but remuneration to labor versus remuneration to the corporate sector or the profit segment of it, um, and whether or not that is part of the underlying imbalances in China. I would encourage brief answers so that we can get some other yeah. questions in. We now? only have about 10 minutes okay, left. Yeah. Yes, now? why don't you? Uh, um, This uh, uh, on, on the equality side, um, I, I personally I 
downbeat at work on that. I mean, I did not have time to, to talk. I mean, you, you really got to come down where, uh, which factor contribute, you know, mostly to this inequality. I mean, we know the Gini coefficient, you know, go uh, between 0 0.45, 0 0.47, and, and so on. But, but the most important gap is the rural urban gap. I mean, I, if I could show you the diagram, it's about 70% of the total inequality in China. If you take away 40% of that, Gini coefficient will drop down dramatically within the reasonable range. range. And, and that's where the urbanization plays a role. That's why I, I have that argument there. And of course, that have implications for consumption, earnings, and so on and so on. Um, labor share versus corporate, you are, you are right, corporate retains a lot of profit, and the government also retains a lot of, uh, a bigger share as we saw. And that's where I'm, I'm hopeful because the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a society where the government is so strong, uh, if they really get serious, they can actually squeeze those profit margins and, and it goes back to the labor. So that's why I, I, where I'm, I'm more optimistic. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Thank you for doing this. Danny Xu Fengjiang with China's Xinhua News Agency. One question for Mr. Wen and one question for Ms. Bautelier. For Ms. Wen, um, looking ahead to next year and next next year, the global demand would be weak given the situation in Eurozone area and a slow economic expansion in countries like United States. Is this a good thing or bad thing for the economic gross model transition for China. And for Mr. Bautadier, what's the rationale of your um, contention that if the share of government consumption and investment is uh, declining, the consumption of uh, Chinese people would be on the rise? Thank you. My answer is very simple. Um, well, it, it, it's, it's bad because you know it contains demand, but it's good it forced China to the corner where they must make an adjustment because for the last 15, 20 years, uh, as I said, they've been trying to adjust, but they had this opportunity to export their you know, capacity to Europe and, and, and US, so they had that space to manipulate, and that's why they were, you know, they did not really take it very, very seriously. Now they have to do it. So from that perspective, it's a good thing. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you, you, you're, worried or concerned that if there is a decline in the investment ratio, that given the relatively low government consumption ratio and the declining consumption GDP, household consumption GDP ratio, that there is a problem. Well, the, the answer is lower gross. If you, if you have 7% gross instead of 10% gross, you can have balance in the economy with a lower investment rate. You can still have sufficient employment growth. Um, I would expect that government consumption in the GDP will rise a little bit. It has fallen uh, in recent years, as you suggested, but the result of the Hu Jintao Wen Jibao government in the last five years in particular is a significant build-up of government capability to provide social services. That will translate in the years ahead in higher government recurrent budget expenditure which China can afford because China's fiscal situation is actually remarkably strong. That's one of the reasons underlying my earlier comment that the quality of economic management in China has actually been rather, rather good compared to most emerging economies. So I, I don't really see that as a problem. I think China's economy will rebalance on the strengths or maybe <laughs> On, on the back of a lower growth rate. It, it will uh, come about almost automatically by itself. But we have to then uh, build in that, that scenario a declining investment GDP ratio. Investment has been growing too fast in recent years. There has been too much waste, uh, empty cities and so on. We all know about these examples. The return on capital have declined. So if China wants to maintain a high but not so crazily high growth rate of around 7% in the years ahead, that can be achieved on the back of lower investment rate. And then the, the consumption GDP ratio would automatically increase. It's a mathematical necessity. We have time for one more question. Um, yes? Uh, up here, San. Mm -hmm. 
James, saying one of your assumptions at the start was uh, that uh, is for future gains is the uh, lag of China from the technology frontier. There's been an argument going on here about how much the technology frontier in the West is going to advance in the future. Bob Gordon has an article saying that it's, we're probably going to be a 1 or 2 percent down from where we were over the last 20 years. To what extent would China be affected by a slowing of uh, tech, te economic gains from technology in the West if, in fact, Western growth was more like 2 percent or 1.5 percent? I mean, <coughs> China is not at the frontier. Right. The frontier is not going to be seen but but they, as we showed, it's it's going to take China. I don't know, 50 years. Can China catch up with the United States? You know, to the f in terms of frontier, I I'm not sure. So you know, U.S. even growing say at two percent, three percent, but you're moving the frontier. Okay, the China growth say talk about eight, seven percent, but. But a large chunk of that is catching up, you know, plus innovation. So I, to me, that, that issue, uh, from that front, I think China still have plenty of space to catch up. Thank you. Uh, Peter, would you like to make any final observations? And then I'll ask Dr. Wan if you have any. Well, this, this last question is intriguing, and I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, as Dr. Wan was saying in his presentation and in his comments, China's rapid productivity growth in the past 20 years has been mostly in the nature of catch-up, right? How far along it is to international technology frontiers, I don't know how you measure these things, and I, I have no reason to question the notion that on average it is still pretty low, but in the manufacturing sector, in quite a number of industries, that, that frontier has been reached or is about to be reached. Maybe nationally not. In agriculture, it is also pretty advanced. So the r I would suggest that the room for further productivity growth based on catch-up is diminishing, and that China will become increasingly dependent on domestic innovation. Whether that, and, and if that becomes a leading factor, it's a big if, then the rate of productivity of technology growth in the West doesn't really matter too much anymore then it becomes a domestically driven technology improvement picture, which we haven't seen so far, so we don't know what China will look like once it becomes a technology leader. Dr. Wan, do you have any final thoughts? No, no I just, uh, probably very briefly on this political reform, uh, which uh, I, I tried to avoid uh, even before I came here, um, but I, I couldn't help because uh, so many people uh, were to ask um, speakers like me to, to, to comment on that. Um, uh, and again, uh, uh, to me, we've got to look at this issue from a dynamic point of view. We've got to look at the trends. We've got to look at the changes, no matter how small it is and whether it's moving in the right direction. Um, I just want to mention two things. One is um, sort of at the lower level of sort of elections, you know, a lot of other problems, but it's been happening. Um, at the village level and it goes to the county level, um, not to the provincial level, of course not to the central leadership yet. But even among the top guys, they have this, what they call it? You know, you, you still have choices, very, very limited amount, but they, they introduce that, mm -hmm. that choices, um, which of course a lot of people say, they, you know, what is that, you know, it's not enough. But to me, it's, it's a starting of something and we'd, we've got to look at from a, you know, a medium dynamic point of view. So that, that's uh, one, one uh, factor I want to emphasize. The, the other fact is we've got to realize is um, the, the role of the People's Congress. Um, of course, we have this another, we have three sort of major political organs in China. You have the political consultative group, and, and then you have this, uh, uh, the core parliament, which is a lot of people say it's, it's a rubber stamp. But, but uh, since the 90s, actually, um, actually the, they're still pretty weak, of course, the, the, the party is very strong, but, but again, we've got to look at the increasing role of the, of the sort of people, People's Congress at various levels, and, and, uh, and also the members of that People's Congress are, are playing a, a different role as well. So um, on political reform, I mean, my point is that uh, it's very, very slow. I, it's, I, I like to see it a bit faster. But China is a huge, huge economy with you know, a, a long history, a lot of issues there, you know, a lot of at the stake. Um, uh, but things 
uh, are changing, um, uh, maybe not you know as fast as as significant as we hope. But uh, I think uh, that's something I, I want to to point out. The other thing is, of course, this issue of you know uh, foreign relationship. You said you know how do you handle China, U.S., uh, China, Europe, and and so on. And I, I, I again before I came, I said I don't really want to talk about that because I'm, I'm not a so you know I'm an economist. Uh, but one thing I, I want to mention. Um, uh, is something I've been sort of paying uh, my attention on uh, again in the last five, six years. And that's something I, I'm trying to do something in China is, is I, I think to me, um, uh, US is the most important partner right now. Europe to some extent also quite important. But again, if you look at the head, uh, dynamic point of view, uh, China must try to manage the relationship with India and very, very fast, they got to put it in. And that's something um, which unfortunately uh, I've been talking to, you know, to some people. Um, very, very small minority starting to realize the importance of that relationship, but the top, even the top leadership, uh, I don't really know how much they're paying attention to that, and that's something um, I think we all got to watch for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning, and uh, please join me in thanking our two speakers, uh, Dr. Wan and Dr. Bottelier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was very interesting. Right. Uh, thank you. Well, that was uh, terrific. Can I yeah. swap cards yeah. with you? No, uh, unfortunately, yeah. I'm traveling, oh. so I don't have a card. I was looking for something. I just wonder how, how yeah. I have managed to avoid you all those years. <laughs> 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 this is my card. Right. Thanks very much. I, okay. you know, I, I will email you. You're based in Manila or in yes, Tokyo? Yes, I am.